Okay, this is 2019 paper two, and we're gonna start with question one. Question one A asks for the equation of the median BD. When I'm doing the equation of a straight line, I like to set out in this format where I call it point gradient equation. I need a point and a gradient to make an equation, so it just separates it nicely for me. You don't need to write it out like this, but it does help sometimes. Okay, the equation of the median BD. So the, the point B, is 11 negative 8. So that's the point we can use when we're doing our equation. But we also need another point so we can find the gradient. So let's go ahead and do the midpoint. So a median meets the opposite side in the middle. So the, the median from B is going to meet AC in the middle at the point D. So to find D, we're going to add our A and C X values together and half it. So you would do minus 5 plus minus 3 all over 2, that will be for the x value. For the y value, you would add their y values together and half it. So minus 12 plus 6 over 2. Minus 8 divided by 2 is minus 4, and minus 6 divided by 2 is minus 3. So that is the midpoint. That's d. So we can use either the 11, negative 8, or the negative 4, negative 3. I tend to use the original point. So I know it's definitely correct and I haven't made any silly mistakes. So I'm going to use B when I do my equation in a little minute. Okay, now for gradient, we're going to write the two coordinates down. I like to put the smaller coordinate first, if I notice. It doesn't really matter. It just helps with the negative signs so you don't get too many of them. Okay, so the gradient is just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And the gradient of the median will just be the gradient that you get between the midpoint and b where it's coming from. There's no perpendicular gradients involved when you're finding the median. Okay, when you minus a minus, you add, so it'll be negative 8 plus 3 over 11 plus 4. So negative 8 plus 3 is 5, 11 fours are 15. Sorry, it's a negative 5. So that would give us negative one third. And the equation, y minus b equals mx minus a. So y plus 8 equals negative one third x minus 11. Multiply the 3 up, so 3y plus 24 equals negative 1 times that bracket. So 3y plus 24 equals negative x plus 11. Now we're just going to subtract the 24 on the other side. And we get negative 13. If you wanted, you could divide through by the 3 and leave it as y equals negative third x, take away 13 over 3. But I'm just going to leave it in that format. I think that's nice and neat, especially because we're going to go on and do simultaneous equations in the part C when we're asked for the point of intersection. Okay, point B asks for the equation of the altitude AE. So when, when it's an altitude, the point has to be the point where it comes from. So it comes from A, point A, so negative 5, negative 12. The altitude will meet the opposite side at right angles. So the opposite side to A is BC. So you're going to go find the gradient of BC. So 11, negative 8, negative 3, 6. Always label them so you don't make any mistakes. Okay, so the gradient's negative 1. Now that's the gradient of BC. So the gradient of AE will be the perpendicular of that. So the perpendicular gradient would just be 1. And that's because they both multiply together to give negative 1 when they're perpendicular. Okay, so we're going to use the minus 12. So y plus 12 equals 1 bracket x plus 5 because a minus minus is a plus. So nice and easy. So y equals x minus 7. You take 12 or 5, you get minus 7. So that's the equation of altitude. y equals x minus 7. Okay, we're going to find the point of intersection here. So I've set them up like simultaneous equations. 
So I'll call that equation 1 and that equation 2. You'll notice they've both got just a singular x. One's negative, one's positive. If we want to eliminate the x's, we would add them together because negative 1 plus 1 makes 0. So we're going to add equations 1 and 2 together. So 4y equals the x's will cancel and negative 13 plus negative 7 is negative 20. So y will equal negative 5. To find the x value, I'm going to use the second equation because it looks easier. So negative 5 equals x take away 7. Then add the 7 onto the 5, you get 2. So x equals 2. So therefore, the point of intersection is 2 comma negative 5. Okay, we're going to integrate 6 root x minus 4x negative 3 plus 5 with respect to x. So if you've got any thirds or fractional, or make everything fractional indices or negative parts, you don't want anything on the denominator, you don't want thirds there. So we're going to make that 6x to the half. Keep our integral sign in because we haven't integrated yet. And everything else is already in tidy form. Okay, now we're ready to integrate. So we're going to add one under the power and divide by that new power. So add one on, you get negative 2, and then divide by negative 2. And then if there's no letter, just pop an x on the end of its dx. If it was dt, you'd pop a t on the end, and so on. Now, just to tidy that up. So if you ever divide by a fraction, you can take the denominator and multiply it up with the numerator. So 2 sixes are 12. So that's going to be 12. I'm going to write it as x cubed in a square root over 3 because x to the 3 over 2 is cubed and in a square root. The root will, will be the denominator part of the fraction. And 12 divided by 3 is 4 so we'll tidy it up to that on the next line. Okay look at the second term. Negative 4 divided by negative 2 is plus 2 and the x to the negative 2 I'm going to bring that down and make that x squared. Okay so we're nearly done. Can you see what I've forgotten? I've forgotten to put something at the end. So unless it's a definite integral, we always need to put a plus c. And we should really have it on the two lines above as well. So we'll go back up and pop them in there. Okay, so it's a definite integral. You don't need it, but you, you do need it otherwise. And that's us all tidied up. Okay, question 3a. Express be in terms of p and r. Okay, so BE, to get from B to E, we just have to look at um, vector paths that we can use. So we've got P, Q and R, so we have to use them. So we can go from B to A and then A to E. Now B to A is against the arrow, so it'll be negative P. And then from A to E is r so negative p plus r or you could write it as r minus p sometimes it's nice, nicer to write it with the negative not first but it's your choice it doesn't matter right on 3b you're asked to express, express vector ef in terms of p q and r but you're told that f divides bc in the ratio of 3 to 1 so let me just show you that so f divides bc in the ratio 3 to 1. So BF will be 3 quarters BC. We're going to need this, so we may as well work this out just now. And then we can pop it in our formula in a minute, or in our answer. So 3 quarters, that will be 3 quarters Q. Because BC is parallel to AD, so BC will be Q. So therefore, BF would be three quarters of that, so three quarters of Q. Always underline your little vectors because they're supposed to be printed in bold. But if you're writing it, you need to underline to show that it's supposed to be bold because you're not on a computer. Okay. Right. Now, we're, now we can go ahead and find EF. So EF. So I always explain with the capital letters and then change into vectors after. So to get from EF, we can go EA then along AB, 
and then BF. So that is negative R plus P plus 3 quarters Q. And again, if you wanted, you could put, it might be tighter to write it as P minus R plus 3 quarters Q, but you get full marks for the line above, so it's not necessary. Okay, on to question four. In a forest, the population of a species of mice is falling by 2.7% each year. So it's decreasing by 2.7%. So let's get its multiplier. Okay, so it's decreasing by 2.7% per year. So basically, it's you're going to have 97.3% of mice year on year. So to get that as a decimal, it's 0 0.973. Therefore, your A value in the recurrence relation is going to be 0 0.973. Your B value will be how many are added in. So let's read it. It says to increase the population, scientists plan to release 30 mice into the forest at the end of March each year. So they're going to add 30 mice every year. So B would equal 30. So our recurrence relation is un plus 1 equals 0 0.973 un plus 30. They didn't ask you for that, they just asked you for a and b, but that's what it is. If you're interested, that was 4a. 4b, part 1. Explain why the estimated population of mice will stabilise in the long term. Well, stabilise means it's going to reach some sort of limit. So if you look at the recurrence relation I've just written above, you can see that 0 0.973 is between negative 1 and 1. So therefore, for we know a limit exists. And because a limit exists, it's going to stabilise in the long term. So a limit exists as 0 0.973 is between negative 1 and 1. Part two is just to go ahead and find that limit. So limit equals b over 1 minus a. b is 30. a is 0.973. And we have to give our answer to the nearest 100. So when we type that into our calculator, we're going to get 1,111.1 recurring, which is just 1,100 to the nearest 100. And that's mice they're talking about. Okay, question five, just sketch the differentiated graph. So they're showing you g of x and they're asking you to sketch g dashed of x. So let's draw a y and x axis. Okay, just check where the turning points or any stationary points, so if you've got any points of inflection as well, they would go to zero. They would go to the y equals zero line, which is on the x axis. So negative two is a stationary point. So it's going to cut on the x-axis and 4 is also a stationary point. Now I just check the gradients. On a differentiated graph, a positive gradient would be above the x-axis and a negative gradient would be below. I always check between the points, the turning points first. So between negative 2 and 4, it's a negative gradient because the, the curve is sloping down to the right. So that means we're going to have a curve underneath the x-axis between negative 2 and 4. After 4, it's a positive gradient, which means it's going to come up. And before negative 2, it's also a positive gradient. So we're left with a nice parabola. And that is y equals g dashed of x. Okay, and this one is a wave function question, and it's in degrees. Just double check if it's in degrees or radians. It's really important. Otherwise, you'll lose lots of marks if you do it in the wrong one. Okay, so the cos expansion is cos cos sine sine, and you change the sine in the middle. So that is a plus. So that means when we are doing it, we're going to have a negative in the middle. Okay, so that will equal k bracket cos x cos a minus sine x sine a. And then multiply the k through. Remember, this is all in your formula sheet if you forget, but it is good to know them just to speed you up on the day of the exam. Okay, just equate 
the term with the cos x on both sides. Okay, so k cos x cos a must be equivalent to 2 cos x, and we can score them off the cos x's, and we're left with k cos a equals 2. Now do the same with the other one. Be careful with the negative at the front. You need to keep that on there. That belongs with this. Okay, that's nice when that happens. So they're both negative, so the negatives are also going to cancel. So you're going to end up with sine a equals 3. Because negative 3 divided by negative 1 is 3. I have forgotten something. Can you spot it? I've forgotten the k. Make sure you pop that in. Don't want to lose that mark. So you should have k sine a and a k cos a at this point. Right, to find your k value, it's like it's like Pythagoras, just square the values together and square root. And the reason this works is because we're really doing sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. Okay, so this works out nice, so just square. We get 4 plus 9 is 13, so it's a square root of 13. Okay, the tan is k sine a over k cos a, which equals 3 over 2. Let's work out what quadrants we're looking for first. So cos is po it's k cos a is 2, so cos is positive, first and fourth quadrant. k sine a equals 3, sine is positive, first and second quadrant. So we're looking at, at first quadrant. Tan's also going to be positive in the first quadrant. Okay, so our acute angle will actually be our a answer, so nice and easy. Inverse tan of 3 over 2, and we get 56.3 degrees. So that would equal root 13 cos x plus 56.3 degrees. Part B. Now we're asked to solve that way of function equal to 3 between 0 and 360. So we're just going to copy it back out again and put it equal to the number 3. We can divide 3 by root 13 to get our acute angle. We can just do shift cos, open a bracket, 3 root 13. If you don't want to use your fraction button, just type in 3 divided by root 13 and close the bracket. And you'll get 33.7 degrees or 33.69 if you want to be slightly more accurate. A little cast diagram at the side. Okay, it was 3 over root 13, so that is positive for cos, so first and fourth quadrant. So our acute angle is 33.7, but we'll need to give the fourth quadrant answer as well. So x plus 56.3 will equal 33.7, and then 360 subtract that, which is 326.3. Now, when we subtract 56.3 off 33.7, we're going to end up with a negative. So what I'm going to do now is add 360 degrees onto the 33.7 to give us an extra value. Because I think that'll still be in range in a little minute when we subtract. So if we subtract 56.3, we get negative 22.6. So that's not a solution. Then 27, or sorry, 270 degrees. And then 337.4 degrees. So that's our two solutions. x equals 270 degrees and 337.4 degrees. So remember with any sine and cosine curve, because they repeat every 360 degrees, you're allowed to add 360 degrees onto this row here. So I added 360 degrees onto the, the 37, 33.7. I'll write it in here. So I added the 360 degrees on to get from here to here. And you can also subtract 360 degrees whenever you want as well. So that's for sine and cos. If it was tan, tan repeats every 180 degrees just. Okay. Okay, 7a, we're completing the square basically. So we need to take out a common factor for the first two terms. This will be a minus 4x because a negative times a negative will give you that plus. Remember to keep the minus 25 in there. Okay, at this point, I just 
write x instead of x squared and then I have that middle number so x minus 2 is all squared and if you're not too sure what the final t the last term would be you can do some work over the sides let's do the working over the side so x minus 2 all squared I'll put the negative 6 on the front as well Okay, so if you multiply this through, you would get negative 6 squared plus 24x minus 24, which is very similar to what we had at the start, but the last term is incorrect. So how do we make negative 25 that's up here from negative 24? So currently on our third line here, we have negative 6 bracket x minus 2 all squared, and we need to subtract 1, and that's us completed the square. So you don't need to do all the work over the right hand side if you don't want to. You could just check the, la the last term by doing negative 2 squared, which is 4, times negative 6 is a negative 24. So it's a negative 24 you're interested in. How did you get back to the negative 25? We need to subtract 1. Okay, 7b. Given that f of x equals that, show that f of x is strictly decreasing. So all we do is differentiate because if it's decreasing, its gradient will be less than zero. So if we can find this out and then sketch it, now that was obviously the same as part A, so I've just changed it back into the computing the square format. Okay, so let's draw this over at the side. It's a sad face and its turning point is going to be at two negative 1 and it's a sad face okay not the best graph let me change that a bit so it looks a bit more symmetrical not sure if that's any better but you get the idea so if that's y equals f dash of x you can see that it's all below the x-axis so we're just going to write a little statement to say since graph of f dash of x is less than 0, f of x is, de is strictly decreasing. I always just copy the exact, their exact wording for it, sometimes I write it different. For all x belonging to the real numbers. Okay, so just show it. You can show it in the graph or you can show it algebraically. So another way to show it algebraically would just be to say that any squared number would be positive and if you times a positive by a negative you would get a negative and then if you subtract one to a negative number you would also end up with a negative so that's how you could do it if you didn't want to sketch you could explain it algebraically as well okay this is the unit a we have a function and we're trying to find its inverse so all we do is let the function be y and change the subject of the formula to x so y minus 8 equals root cube root of x and then we can just cube the other side and that will equal x so let's rewrite it and then all we do is replace the x with the inverse function and replace the y with x okay 8b state the domain of the inverse function now the domain and the range of the inverse of each other so if you find the range using the values that you were given, so you were told that x is between 1 and 1,000. So if you find the range of the original, so the function was cube root of x plus 8. So if we just let the 1 be in place of x, we get 9. And then if we do the same... with a thousand we get 18 so the domain for the inverse function will be that x is between 9 and 18 okay 9a electricity on a spacecraft can be produced by a type of nuclear generator and the electrical power produced by this generator can be modelled by this. 
Um, the power is in watts and in the T represents years. The terminal electrical power initially produced by the generator, that just means let the time be zero. Now anything to the power of zero is just going to be zero. So if you multiply this decimal by zero, you're just going to get zero. Anything to the power of zero is one. So the answer will be 120 watts. Part B. Now they're saying how long does it take to reduce by 15%. You could find 15% of 120 and subtract it and then do a division. But a reduction of 15% just means it will now be worth 85%. So I just put 0 0.85 equal to the exponential straight away. It saves us a little bit of time. And then just take the length of both sides. Lin E will cancel, so you're just left with the pyre. And then we can just divide to find T. So then of 0 0.85 equals 20.57 years. Which is approximately equal to 20 years and 7 months. Okay, this is 10a. We're going to show that x plus 3 is a factor of 3x to the power of 4 plus 10x cubed plus 1x squared minus 8x minus 6. So we set up our synthetic division with the coefficients of all the powers in order from highest power down to no power at all. So 3 was the coefficient of x to the power of 4 and negative 6 was a single number with no power at all. So just make sure if there's any power missing that you put a zero in that position. Right, to show that x plus 3 is a factor, we're going to let minus 3 be the root, so the root goes on to the left hand side. Bring the 3 down, multiply it by negative 3, you get negative 9, then add, we get 1. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3, add, we get negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 3 is 6, add, we get negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6, and you add, you get 0. So that's perfect. So, uh, Okay, so the remainder is 0. So x plus 3 is a factor. Okay, part B asks us to fully factorise this down. So what I would do is actually draw another synthetic division underneath that, and you've got all your coefficients already there. So let's try one, see if that works. Perfect, that worked. So now we can fully factorise. So f of x equals x plus 3, x minus 1, 3x squared plus 4x plus 2. And we'll check if we can factorise that last bracket down as well. The 1 was the first number I tried. If the 1 hadn't have worked, I would have just tried another number that divides into 2. So minus 1, 2 or minus 2. So just, if the first one you try doesn't work, don't worry. Just try another one. Okay, let's factorise this. So 2 and 1... If I put a 2 there and a 1 there, that'll make 6x and 1x, which doesn't work. No, that doesn't work. So we're going to just stop. Just rub that all out. Okay, that can't be factorised, so you're done. But if you can factorise that last bracket, make sure you do so. Okay, so that's us fully factorised for 10b. To make sure that this bracket doesn't factorise, you could do the discriminant, just to be sure. So b squared minus 4ac. If it doesn't factorise, you'll get a negative. So 4 squared minus 4 times 3 times 2 is 16. 
subtract 24, so negative 8, okay? Which is less than 0, so therefore it won't factorise. So just to explain to you why that does not factorise. Okay, this is question 11. 11a is the optimization problem solving question where we're trying to figure out the formula that they're giving us for the total surface area. They tell us about the volume is 2000 centimetres cubed, so that's going to help us figure out what h is in terms of x so we can substitute it into the surface area. So the volume is going to be the large volume, subtract the small volume. So we'll write out the formula for volume twice. Okay, the large cuboid is 3x times 3x times the height, because you're told it's made up of a square. Okay, so that's why we know it's 3x times 3x, and then the height will be different. Okay, so that's 9x squared h. The small one is x by x by h, so x squared h. So the volume, the total volume, will equal 9x squared h subtract x squared h, which is 8x squared h. Now we know that that's equivalent to 2000. So I'm just going to write that 8x squared h equals 2000 and rearrange it. So h equals 2000 over 8x squared. Now we'll use this once we get our surface area and then we'll be able to replace the h with the 2000 over 8x squared. Okay, the surface area. Okay, you've got six faces on the main cuboid, but you also have to remember about the tunnel faces. So inside the tunnel, there's four faces on that as well. Okay, so let's start with the outside cuboid. So you've got 3xh and you've got four lots of those because you've got the front, back, left-hand side and right-hand side. And they're all 3x times h. So there's four of those. The top is going to be 3x times 3x, which is 9x squared. But you have to remember to subtract the square from the tunnel out of that. So 9x squared to take away x squared is 8x squared. And you've got two lots of those because you've got the top and the bottom. Now we're into the interior tunnel. So the interior tunnel has four walls inside it. That is x by h. So there's four of those, so 4xh. So let's tidy that up. So 12xh plus 16x squared plus 4xh, which is 16x squared plus 16xh. We're nearly done. All we have to do is replace our h that we got when we worked out our volume, worked backwards from our volume, I should say, to find the h value, and we got. 2000 over 8x squared. That works out quite nice because 16 divided by 8 is 2. So that'll be 4000 if you multiply that in with the 2000. And we'll just have 1x left on the bottom as required. Okay, here we're asked to find the minimum, minimum value of a. So a of x equals 16x squared plus 4,000x to the minus 1. Okay, so a dash of x will equal 32x minus 4,000x to the minus 2. We'll just tidy that up. So just put it over x squared. Now a, a dash of x equals 0 for stationary points. And we'll do this when we're doing optimization as well. So let's put it equal to zero. So 32x would equal 4,000 over x squared. Then we can multiply the x squared up to get 32x cubed equals 4,000. So x cubed equals 4,000 over 32, which is 125. And when you square root the, um, sorry, cube root 125, you get 5. Okay, so it must be 5 centimetres for a minimum area, but let's double check.
Okay, so basically you pick a value that's less than 5 to substitute into your a dash of x. So if I pick, you can't pick 0 because you can't divide by 0, but you could pick 1. So 32 take away 4,000 is obviously going to be negative. So I've picked a 1 there and I've got a negative answer. You'll always get 0 for the 5 or whatever values are there. Now let's check a number bigger than 5. I'm going to check 10 just because it's quite easy. And we get a positive answer of 280. So it's a min surface area when x equals 5 centimetres. And now we actually have to go and find the area. So a of 5 equals 16 times 5 squared plus 4,000 over 5. So that's 400 plus 800, which is 1,200 centimetres squared. So that's your minimum area. And that is when x equals 5 centimetres. Okay, this is question 12. We've got y equals ab to the x, and we've got a base on the on the graph, it's base 4. So just be careful with that. Let's take logs of both sides. So it's log to the base 4 we have to do. And then we can separate using our laws of logs. And then bring the x to the front because it's a pyre. Okay, so I'm going to write it again. Log y to the base 4 equals x log b to the base 4 plus log a to the base 4. I've purposely changed the order so that it's in the form y equals mx plus c. I've done a capital Y because it's log y. Now, my gradient is going to be equivalent to log b. And my y-intercept is going to be equivalent to log a to the base 4. Okay, we've got two coordinates, so we can just work out the gradient. I normally actually do this at the start, I just forgot to find the gradient. So feel free to do this at the start, but if you forget, you can do it at this point and then put it across. So the gradient is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So 8 plus 1 over 3 minus 0, which is 9 over 3, which is 3. The y-intercept, you can see clearly from the graph, is minus 1. So the gradient was equivalent to log b to the base 4. So I'm going to put that equal to 3. Now the base raised to the answer will make b. So we can say that b is 4 cubed, which, which is 64. Now our a, our log a to the base 4 was equivalent to our c value. So we're just going to do 4 to the power of negative 1 and that will give us our a. Now that's the same as 1 over 4 to the power of 1, so 1 quarter. And therefore, that's us done. We just want to write it in the format y equals ab to the x. So a quarter, 64 to the x. Okay, the rate of change is 3x squared minus 16x plus 11. Rate of change means the differentiated function. Okay, so if we want to find f of x, we need to integrate. So 3x cubed divided by 3, 16 minus 16x 16 squared over 2 plus 11x plus c. So x cubed minus 8x squared plus 11x plus c. Now you were told a piece of information. You were told where it cuts the x-axis and that's 7, 0. So 7, 0. So we're going to substitute that in so we can find our c. So 0 is our f of x and 7 is our x value. 
So if we just work that out and rearrange it, we'll be able to find our C value. Okay, so 343 subtract 392 plus 77 is 28. So 0 equals 28 plus C. So C would equal negative 28. And all we do is write our f of x back out again. But instead of plus C, we can write minus 28. So x cubed minus 8x squared plus 11x minus 28. And that is our, that is our f of x function. Okay, this is question 14. We're told the magnitude of u is 4, the magnitude of v is 5, and u dot u plus v equals 21. Okay, so if we expand that out, u dot u plus u dot v equals 21. u dot u is the magnitude of u, the magnitude of u, cos theta, this is on your formula sheet, remember. Cos theta will be cos zero because the angle between u and u has to be zero because they're the same. So that's just four times four times one cos zero is one, so 16. u dot v equals magnitude of u, magnitude of v, cos theta, and we don't know the angle this time. u dot, magnitude of u is four, magnitude of v is five, so 20 cos theta would be u dot v. Okay, let me do a little wiggly line down there so it's not getting confusing. Okay, u dot u is 16, so 16 plus 20 cos theta equals 21. So 20 cos theta equals 5, and then cos theta equals a quarter, because 5 divided by 20 is a quarter. Now theta it's just going to be the inverse of that. And we get 75.5 degrees. So that's the angle. Okay, this is question 15. So we're going to find the equation of the tangent at P. So just remember that radius and tangents always meet at right angles. So if we find the gradient of PC first, and then we can flip it upside down and change the sign. So the gradient is label it first so don't make a mistake y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 so 12 minus 13 over 8 minus 5 so minus 1 over 3 so minus a third so the, the perpendicular of that would be 3 since m1 times m2 equals negative 1 and then we just do y minus b equals mx minus a. We know that the tangent is at p, which is a 5, 13. I'll just highlight that. So we're going to use that coordinate and that gradient. So y minus 13 equals 3x minus 5. y minus 13 equals 3x minus 15. Let's go over here. So y equals 3x minus 2. Part B. Part 1 says states the coordinate of t. t is where the tangent meets the y-axis. So our tangent is y equals 3x minus 2. If it meets the y-axis, it means the x value is 0. So that's going to give us minus 2. So therefore, t is 0 minus 2. OK, part 2. OK, if p and t is a tangent to the radius, then you know that's going to make a right angle triangle. And right angle triangles inside semicircles means that ct would be a diameter. So the centre of the circle is going to be the midpoint of CT. Okay, so CT is, eight, well, C is 8, 12, and T is 0, minus 2. 
So to find the midpoint, you would just do 8 plus 0 over 2 and 12 minus 2 over 2. So 4, 5. So that's the midpoint. To get the radius, it's going to be the distance formula between 4, 5 and 0, minus 2. So I'm going to call this x1, y1 because they're smaller. This x2, y2. So the distance, the radius is going to be the distance formula between these. So it's going to be x2 minus x1 all squared plus y2 minus y1 all squared. So 16 plus 49, which is the square root of 65. The equation of the circle is just x minus a all squared plus y minus b all squared equals radius squared. So x minus 4 all squared plus y minus 5 all squared equals 65. The square root of 65 all squared would just be 65, and that's your equation of the circle, and that's us done.